Scripture reading today is Romans chapter 1, verses 14 through 16. Romans chapter 1, verses 14 through 16. I am obligated both to Jews, both, excuse me, I am obligated both to Greeks and to non-Greeks, both to the wise and the foolish. That is why I am so eager to preach the gospel also to you who are in Rome. For I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. Good morning, church. I think we have uh, people visiting with us. We're glad you're here. And this is a great day to be here, I think, with the lesson that we're going to share. Uh, I teach a class on Wednesday night here at 7 o'clock, and it's dealing with end times. Um, everyone in here, we're going to die. You may not want to talk about it. You may not want to think about it. But we're mortal. What's next? What happens after you die? Is there anything? Do you, are you dead all over like the old dog Rover? Or is there, is there a, a resurrection? Is there hope? And so that's kind of what we're dealing with on Wednesday night. And so if you're, if you're free, I have a class for adults. We have kids, uh, kids classes on Wednesday night. So you guys who have families, you can come back, bring your kids. We'll teach them at their age level. And so, uh, but that's what the adults are dealing with. Another problem we have it's a problem I have. I'm a sinner. How about you? Another problem I have, and I don't know if you have it, but I continue to sin. How about you? Uh, I don't want to. I, I went to school. To, I graduated from two different schools in Bible, and I still sin. I don't want to, but I do. How about you? And I think that's why that uh, leads up to this thing, the gospel. We need it. We really need the gospel. Why? I'm a sinner. I continue to sin, and this body is going to die. Is there any hope? Well, I believe there's hope. And Jesus brings that hope to us. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 18, it says, The preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us which are saved, it's the power of God. The preaching of the cross to this man is the power of God. It's not foolish. But how about you? You know, you could be here today and your parents drug you here. And you may be saying, oh my goodness, again? You may be here and your mom made you come. Or your dad made you come. I know in this room, you know, we got almost 180 people in here. We got all kinds of ideas about being here. Uh, some of you, you, you know, you grew up here. Uh, you've been here for years. You're, you're church mice. And, and, and you've been here, and this is just another academic experience. It's another opportunity to open up scripture and say, yeah, we've read that before. But you're here. There's others who are here, and maybe you're here for the first time, and you're thinking, well, what's this group about, you know? What are, what's their focus? Um, and I'm sure there's all kinds of degrees in between. That you're here, you don't really want to be here, you'd rather be at the beach, or at the casino, or at the mall, or at home in bed, <laughs> okay? But you're here, and, and I, hope, I hope to remind you, and I, I hope that as we do these lessons, it's not just academic. Uh, I want you to experience the power of God in your life. Um, that God can transform a person. God can change you. Uh, most of the folks know in this room, I've been arrested. I've been behind bars when I was a kid. I'm much happier to be right here. But there's something that happened, and I'm not the same person I used to be, thank God. And so some of us, this is not just an academic experience, it's life. It's really life or death for some of us. It, it, we've been transformed by it. And so I do believe in the power of, of the gospel. And I'm going to spend a few weeks, uh, Donnie preaches some, I preach some, but whenever I'm up here, I want to just focus on key verses in Romans. Romans. 
I'm not just going through verse by verse. I do that on Wednesday night. But during the sermons, I just kind of kind of unpack it for you, make it a little, condense it down. And so I'm just looking at some key verses. Uh, the, the book of Romans is different than other. It was written by Paul. Uh, we know that from the first verse. Um, and Paul, Paul is... He, he, his approach is different. Usually when he writes to a church, he's been there and they know him. Like Corinthians, he was there for 18 months. They know Paul. He, pro, he spoke there. Uh, Thessalonica and other places, Paul went there. And so when Paul would do a, a, a write a letter to them, he would remind them of things that he said to them. Paul's never been to Rome, was never there. And so he wants to go, and he, he will end up going there, but at this point, he, doesn't, he hasn't been there. All they know are rumors about Paul. All that Paul knows about the church in Rome is that there's a church in Rome. And so what he does, he writes a letter, uh, and he, he, it's very long. It's 16 chapters. Back 2,000 years ago, uh, they didn't have access to writing material on printing presses like we do. So something that big was kind of unusual. Most letters were not that long. Paul wrote 16 chapters to this church. Why? He's never been there. And so there's a lot that he wants to tell them. And so he's unpacking it for them. He's, he's saying, okay, there, here's some things. If I would have been there, you would have heard this from me. But I haven't been there yet, so I'm just going to unload. Here we go, 16 chapters. And so Paul writes from that perspective, and so he's, he's kind of working him through some things he would have said if he had been there. Um, a cool thing about the book of Romans, in every great revival in, within Christianity, somehow the book of Romans has been involved. There's usually two things that happens for, for a revival to take place in a church or in a nation. One is prayer, and the other is the book of Romans. It's a very powerful book. If you haven't spent some time with it, I would encourage you to read it through verse by verse. Martin Luther, who left the Catholic Church and started the Lutheran Church, started reading the book of Romans. John Wesley, who started the Methodist Church, started reading the book of Romans. And so there's power in it. You get what I'm saying? There's power in the words. If you haven't invested in it and, and spent time with it, I would encourage you to do so. My next lesson, I will talk about faith, because that's really what this book is about, justification by faith. It begins with faith and ends with faith, so it's very important doctrine in there. Another word is the word gospel. It's used a lot, over a hundred times in the New Testament, I believe. What does the word gospel mean? When I say the gospel, some of, some of you may think Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but the word gospel means good news. That's what it means. 2,000 years ago, it had a political meaning. If there was a, an emperor was coming into town, that would be the good news. That would be like Trump coming into town. That would be good news, right? Uh, for some of you, for others not, right? But back then, that's, it had a political meaning. It, 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 was, it meant the emperor was coming. I'm going to tell you, that's not the one I'm talking I'm not talking about Democrat or Republican here. I'm talking about the King of Kings. The Lord of all. And he knows who's running this country. All right? And he's above who's running this country. That's really good news, isn't it? That we, that's the king, that's the glad tidings, that's the... The good news that Paul proclaimed. He, it had a political context, but Paul didn't use it that way. He's, he's saying, I'm talking to you about the king of kings. Someone defined the gospel like this. In 1 Corinthians 15, Paul will say that I declared unto you the gospel, and you received it, and you're saved by it. If you remember it, I don't know why that happened. Thank God for young people. <laughs> Thank you, Emily. Give him a... <laughs> Young people, stay close to me. <laughs> so what is the gospel according to the Apostle Paul? In 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 and 4, 
he says, For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. That's good news. Amen, church? You know what the power is? The power is that Jesus died for you. That takes, that takes care of my sin problem. But there's more good news. I'm mortal. You're mortal. We're going to die. Jesus also died, but he came out. Is that fantastic news? I don't know why you're here today. Your mom and dad, dad might have yanked you here. But the thing that should put life in your body is that you serve a risen Christ. That's good news. That is the king of kings. It's not Trump or anybody else. It's the one who went into the grave and came out. That's why I'm here today. I hope that's why you're here. And there's power to that. And you can be freed from it. And so Paul will spend this book talking about faith in this person. Faith in Jesus Christ. And he calls it the gospel. And in Romans chapter 1 and verse 2, he says the gospel he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. The gospel that I'm presenting to you today is talked about in the Old Testament. There's 39 books in the Old Testament. And some of those verses talk about Jesus. Someone said if you take the Bible that's 66 books, the Old Testament says somebody's coming. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John say he has come. And then the rest of it says he's going to come back. That's one way of looking at this book. All right? It's the good news. And Paul wants us to know the gospel was promised beforehand through his prophets. I'm not going to take the time, but read Isaiah 53 in the Old Testament. It was written about 450 years before Jesus was born. And that whole chapter talks about the Messiah. In Isaiah 53, 6, uh, one of the verses, it says, All we like sheep have gone astray. Everyone has turned to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. What does that mean? Our iniquity is laid on him. It goes back to that, doesn't it? When Jesus died on the cross, our sins was placed on him. That's good news, isn't it? And that's what Paul is saying. The gospel was preached even in the Old Testament by the prophets in the Holy Scriptures. But it's interesting that Paul will say, or this is a definition that someone said about uh, the gospel. It is the salvation unleashing story of Jesus. I like the graphic. That's, that's why I used it. It's, it's this chain that's broken. And that's a beautiful thing thing that Jesus can do to people. He can take people who are in bondage and give them freedom. He can take people who don't know why they're here and give them a purpose. He can take someone like myself that used to abuse drugs and alcohol and say, that's foolishness, Jim. Why are you doing that? I called you to something else and for us to be delivered from that. That is the power of the gospel. It, it is the unleashing power of Jesus in a person's life. And so, Paul will say in this chapter, and we read it, and Todd read it for us, that he's not ashamed of it. Think about the word shame, being ashamed of something. Have you ever thought about it? The, the real issue is that it brings us undue attention. And, and we get embarrassed. And there's many things that, think of the things that made you, that embarrass you. Maybe you're walking down the street and you trip. But there's nothing there. All right? For whatever, you just fumble over your own feet. And guess what you do? You look around to see if anyone noticed, right? And you look around like, oh, there's, surely there was something there. But there wasn't anything there. You just stumbled over your own feet. Isn't that embarrassing? Or you're in a restaurant and you spill everything in your lap. Any of you ever do that? And you look at what do you do? You look around. Did anyone see that? It's what other people think about what we just did. That's what we get embarrassed about. I heard about a guy who was a, a, a preacher and he got up in front of everyone and realized that his pants were unzipped. 
That's embarrassing, right? And so he said, okay, let's pray. And so he knelt his head down and led in prayer and zipped up his pants. Didn't realize he put his tie in his zipper. And so he was trying to raise his head. He says, let's pray again. And so, all right. You know, the issue is somebody else sees it. And because somebody else sees it, that's what makes us embarrassed. It's like shooting an air ball. If you're all by yourself, you, you miss the basket. But if you're in a basketball game and you hit an air ball, air ball, you know, we would never do that. Oh, yeah, it happens, right? And people see it, and, and they, 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 because other people see it, we're embarrassed by it. Well, what's the point? I think it's a very good point for the church. We, sometimes we get embarrassed. When we're together like this, it's, it's easier. But when we're out on the street, we're a little reluctant to talk about Jesus, right? Because we're afraid of what other people think. I want you to think about who Paul is writing to. He's writing to Christians in the city of Rome 2,000 years ago. What was going on in Rome? Rome was a polytheistic culture. Back then, you, you can go to Rome today, and some of you have been there, there's ruins there. And some of those ruins are pagan temples. That 2,000 years ago, there was idolatry in that city. In fact, I, I came across a document, and it, it was a, in the fourth century, there was a guidebook on how to go to Rome and what to see. And back in the fourth century, even then it says that Rome had 424 temples, 304 shrines, and 80 statues to various gods. So 2,000 years ago, when Paul was writing this letter to Christians, there were pagan temples all over the city. And there was this God and that God. And the Romans, they had an interesting feature that whenever they would conquer somebody, they said, look, uh, we're not going to take your God away from you. We just want you to add one more to your list. That you need to bow down to the emperor and make him your God as well. And so they had emperor worship. Now, would that be a problem for a Christian? Oh, yeah. Christians and Jews, we're, we're fiercely monotheistic. We believe there's only one God. And so Paul is writing to a church that believes in one God. And he's the gospel. He's the king of kings and lord of lords. And, and the Roman says, that's fine. You can believe in your one God. Just add him to your list. The Christians couldn't do it. And they were persecuted because of that. You know what the Romans actually called them? They called them atheists because they believed in one God. And they also, some of them called them cannibals because they ate bread and drank blood. Uh, blood. When they took commun communion, that the pagans called them cannibals. They, they're atheists and they're cannibals because they eat flesh and drink blood. But the people misunderstood. Is that still valid today? People misunderstand us? Do we still live in a, in a culture where there's many gods? Why in this building twice or three times the size with more people? Because there's other gods. And people are out doing the other god thing. I bet there's a lot more people at the mall or, or at the ca casinos today than here. Don't you? And so you and I can be tempted to be embarrassed because of what other people think. Another problem with Rome is that it was hedonistic. That hedonism is the love of pleasure. That if you start looking at, at some of those people back then, the things that they did would embarrass us. There were things done in the Roman culture that would still be illegal in the United States. That there were things that they would do as a, as a society that was just despicable, ugly, just dirty. But yet it was part of their culture. How about Christians? Christians, after you follow the king of kings, you're supposed to clean yourself up. Amen? Amen. 
that it wouldn't be any good for me to be preaching to you today if I was still doing drugs and alcohol, right? That you would, you would expect me to not keep on doing that if I believe in Jesus, right? But that's not just me, that's you too. Amen? That Jesus says, look, if you follow me, you've got to believe I'm the king of kings. You need to listen to me. You need to do what I tell you to do. And there's some things that we have to stop doing if we follow Jesus. And so, again, the, the Christians would struggle with just the hedonistic, uh, pleasure-seeking society that was going on. Uh, there's a passage in the, New, in the New Testament, Gospel of John, that I think is appropriate. It says, among the crowds there was widespread whispering about him. That's about Jesus. Someone said, he's a good man. Others replied, no, he deceives the people. But no one would say anything publicly about him for fear of the leaders. They didn't want to be embarrassed, right? That they didn't really want to go public because they would get so much opposition from the leaders. And I think that still, does that still happen to us, church? Do you and I still hold back? I bet on the job you do. I bet on the job you could, you could be there and you might be the only Christian there. And you feel that pressure that you don't want undue attention. I know, I know some of you who are younger and you're still in school. It's tough, right? It's tough in the classroom to say, I'm a Christian. And then sometimes even when you get older, it becomes even crazier, you know, that I've been in a college class at Western Connecticut State University taught by an atheist. And he started ridiculing Christians. And he said, oh, none of you are creationists, are you? And the idea of creationists is that you believe that Genesis, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. I raised my hand. I was the only one. I felt really bad. There was like 30 or 40 people in the class. I was the only one who said, maybe they, I said, well, maybe they don't know what he's talking about. But I raised my hand and he looked at me. I looked at him. He looked at me. I looked at him. <laughs> And I guess he didn't want to go into it because he said, well, we all have to come from something. And he went on. But he was taunting. He was trying to embarrass somebody that would say that I believe in God. Paul says, I'm not ashamed of it. You shouldn't be ashamed of it either. And I know we're going to feel out of place. It could even happen within the culture. I remember studying with a woman from Pakistan. And so she grew up Muslim. And she told me that whenever she walked down the street in Pakistan, she couldn't even walk by the male members of her family. She had to walk behind them. All right? I want to tell can I deviate? Why are we allowing that to spread in this country? Do we not understand what's going on? That, that we're, we're, we're saying it's okay, let's just be tolerant. Do you understand what's taught? If you read the Quran, it actually it says it. I've read it, that a man is superior to a woman. It says it. And I wonder, why do we want that? I don't get it. I really don't. But anyway, the woman was telling me about what her experience was as a Muslim in Pakistan and how she couldn't even walk beside her, her brothers or her father. She had to walk behind them. Now imagine if she became a Christian. Would that create a problem? <laughs> she would feel all kinds of outside looking on kind of thing. And, and the, the oppression that would go on and the persecution that would go on. I want you to know the guy who wrote this, he used to be called Saul of Tarsus. You guys know that, right? And Saul of Tars Tarsus persecuted people like us. He would go into church buildings and he would find people worshiping Jesus Christ and he would drag them off to prison. Do you understand that? That's the man who wrote this letter. And in Acts chapter 9, Jesus appears to him and he's converted. He becomes the Apostle Paul. He knows what it's like to be persecuted. Um, just going through the, the book, um, in Acts chapter 16, Paul preached in Philippi and they beat him up and threw him in prison. 
In Acts chapter 17, he preached in Thessalonica, and they ran him out of town. In Athens, when he preached in the city of Athens, which was a very intellectual city, they laughed at him and ridiculed him. So Paul knew what it was like to suffer persecution. He was actually stoned twice, physically stoned, not drunk. They, they took up stones and they hit him with it. Twice he was stoned. But he knew, you know, he says, I'm not ashamed. I'm not ashamed. Why? There's some things that he says about himself that will help me understand this. One thing Paul will say, I'm a slave. That's one reason. And in Romans chapter 1 and verse 1, he says, Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God. I looked into this Greek word for ser uh, servant, and it's doulos. That's the Greek word. And it, means, it doesn't mean slave. I mean, it doesn't mean service. It means slave. The translators should have translated it that way. I don't know why they, did, they said servant, but the Greek word literally means bondservant. That's very powerful. How could Paul preach the gospel? How can you be bold and courageous? If you're a slave, that will help. And, you know, we're offended by that word and we're taken back by it. When Paul wrote this letter, a third of the city of Rome were literally slaves. You know, the apostle Paul doesn't know how to write a resume. Because if you're trying to impress people, you usually don't say, I'm a slave. You usually try to build yourself up and say, I did this, I did this, I did this, right? But Paul, in the very first verse, introduces himself as a slave of Jesus Christ. I want to ask you, church, would that make a difference? Would that make a difference in this group if we really became slaves of Jesus Christ? In Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20, Paul says, I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. You guys know that verse, right? Paul says, I'm crucified to Christ. Nevertheless, I live. That's another way of Paul saying that he's a slave. And I know that it's offensive to a lot of people, but Paul uses it as an illustration of himself. And he's describing himself. This is what I am. I am a slave. Slaves do not negotiate. They don't, they don't say, I don't do Sundays, I don't do mornings, and I don't do windows. A slave is under the control of somebody else. The reason that Paul was so successful, he was under the control of Jesus. And that transformed him. And it's not just him who was purchased. I'm looking at a group of people. If you're in the church, you are purchased by Jesus Christ. And Paul will say this, take watch over yourselves and all the flock over which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds. He's talking to the elders. Be shepherds of the church of God, which he hath what? Bought with his own blood. If you are a Christian, Jesus bought you. You understand that? That you were purchased by the blood of Jesus Christ. You were a slave to sin, and his blood has bought you. You now belong to him. If we can get that, it'll transform us. It transformed Paul, and I think it'll transform us as well. Another thing he says as he introduces himself to this group that had never met him, he says, I'm obligated. I'm obligated. In Romans chapter 1, verse 14, I'm obligated both to the Greeks and the non-Greeks, both to the wise and to the foolish. Sometimes some translations use the word I'm indebted. Most of the time we don't like debt. I've got a mortgage, I don't like it. I got a car payment, don't like that either. I'm indebted to the bank for a car payment and a house. But the word that he's using here is more like I've given you something to give to somebody else. Please make sure they get it. Uh, sometimes people will hear about a need in the congregation and, and they'll say, look, I want this to be anonymous. I want this to go to that person. I'm going to give it to you. Make sure they get it. 
And that's a very good analogy for the gospel, isn't it? If you are a Christian, good news has come to you. You should feel obligated to give it to somebody else. Amen, church? That you should feel indebted that Jesus died for you and delivered you from bondage. And you should feel indebted to share that with somebody else. You should feel obligated to do it. Why? He died for you. You've been purchased by his blood. And you should be able to share that with somebody else. An illustration. Maybe you remember this. There was this cruise ship over in Italy. In 2012, it ran aground. And over almost 40 people died. That's a bummer vacation, isn't it? And so they're out having a good time, and they're on this cruise ship, and it, it runs aground. I want you to think about what that was like if you were on that ship. I bet there's some people saying, I'm taking care of me. I'm making sure I'm getting off this boat, right? And if you're with a loved one, you're saying, I'm going to take care of me. I'm going to take care of my family. We're going to get off this boat. I bet a lot of people fell that way. And, but I bet there's probably somebody trying to say, let's try to save as many as possible. Amen? And you know, you could be sitting here today and saying, look, Jesus has come to me, but it stopped there. That I, I've been freed. He's delivered me from bondage. I, 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 when I stand before him, I'm going to be washed by his blood. Praise God, I'm happy. But shouldn't you share that with somebody else? Shouldn't you be somebody not just saying, I'm going to take care of me. All right? The gospel's come to me. It hadn't gone to anybody else. But it's come to me, and I, I'm thankful for that. I believe that we need to realize that, look, on this world, it's a sinking ship. Everything in this world, and it goes to my class on Wednesday night, you know, the Bible says someday all of this is going to be burned up. You realize that? That everything here is just temporary. It's all going to be burned up someday. And if that's going to happen, shouldn't I tell something? Shouldn't I tell people? There's a way to get out of that? There's a way to be freed from that where you don't have to worry about it? You can say, Lord, come quickly. I'm ready because I'm yours. I've been purchased. And so you and I should feel this responsibility and this indebtedness, I guess, to the lost world. It's sinking. We need to rescue people. And another thing that he says in his little resume, he says, I'm eager to do it. He says, I, he, he says in this verse, I am so eager to preach the gospel. How about you? How about me? I, I have reservations. Sometimes I don't want to be embarrassed either. And, and I hold back whenever I've got the best news on the planet. And Paul says, I'm eager. I'm eager to share. You see, God wants all people to be saved. Everyone. In fact, Jesus will, will even say this, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. We call it the Great Commission. And that's the mission of this church, is that we want to seek people and help them to follow Jesus and help them to grow up. That's our, our mission statement here. Teach and grow followers of, of, of Jesus. And so uh, we're called with this great commission, and you and I should be like Paul and say, I'm not ashamed of it. He will say in Romans 1, verse 16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it's the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew and then to the Gentile. The Greek word for power is is uh, dynamite. Dunamis is the Greek word. We get our word dynamite from it. That the gospel is God's dynamite that can change a person. Look at what it did to Saul of Tarsus. He persecuted Christians, and then he comes to know Jesus, and then he becomes the apostle Paul. That's power, isn't it? And his power, some of us are living examples of that change. Is that we, we lived radically different lives before we became followers of Jesus. And how he's been able to transform that. I think you and I, and I think churches across the United States, we're seeking to become relevant. We want to feel relevant to the culture. And sometimes because of our efforts to try to become relevant, we water down the message. 
And so we need to get out of that and just preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. We need to be bold and say, look, I'm a Christian. I follow Jesus. I'm not ashamed of it. And so we can domesticate the gospel if we talk about Jesus but not talk about sin. That's one way of, of changing it. We can domesticate the gospel if we no, ignore the Holy Spirit. We can domesticate the gospel when we turn repentance into some kind of self-help. We can domesticate the gospel when we're more concerned about offending someone than saving somebody. We can domesticate the gospel when we leave. We, we try to make the church just comfortable for everybody. That we're here, you know, turn it into a cruise ship. We can domesticate the gospel when we start thinking that the mission of the church is to make people happy. The mission of the church is to seek and to save the lost. That's our mission. We're called to do that. And we shouldn't be embarrassed and ashamed. We should be obligated. We should be eager to share. What should put some fuel under us? goes back to what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received. How that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. That he was buried and that he rose again the third day. That's the Jesus I serve. If you're here today and you worship him, that's the Jesus you serve. That's where the power is. In Romans 10 verse 17, the Bible says, Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You've got to hear it. But it's not just enough to hear. James 2.19 says, the, the devil also believes and trembles. So you've got to do more than just believe. You know there's no atheists in hell. Uh, they all believe down there, right? So it's more than just believing. You've got to be willing to change. And, and, and Luke, uh, Luke 13, verse 3, Jesus will say, repent or perish. So you've got to be willing to change your life. You've got to be willing to come under my lordship. I'm master and, and commander, and, and you've got to let me be lord. So anything that I had to die for, you need to get, a, get away from. That's what repentance is. Romans 10, 9 and 10, it says, Confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and you'll be saved. We need to go public. We need to say Jesus is Lord. But there's another thing that Jesus talks about. He, he, we read it earlier in Mark 16. But something that Paul talks about too is, are these verses in, in Romans chapter 6. Where he says, or don't you know that many of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death. That just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in newness of life. For if we've been united together uh, in the likeness of his death, certainly we we'll also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. Paul says there's a, there's a moment where you and I are crucified. There's a moment when you and I are buried. What is that moment? He, he explains it here that when a person is baptized, they're buried into Jesus. And just like Jesus was raised up, we too walk in newness of life. So the gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. How do you respond to that? You respond by faith. You respond by repentance. You confess him as Lord. But it also says you need to get in the water. You need to have your sins washed away. And why? Because it becomes a time that you are crucified. A time that you're buried. Just like Jesus was buried. Just like Jesus was raised up. You are raised up to walk in newness of life. All of us in this church have done this. Recently, uh, I see John Courier back there. He was baptized about four weeks ago. He got it. The gospel was presented to him. He says, uh, it was one night, I think Tuesday night or Thursday night, John looks at me and he says, I'm ready to be baptized. And I said, well, you don't have to wait. And he says, how about tonight? And so he was baptized on Tuesday or Thursday night about four weeks ago. Why? Because he wanted the old self to be buried. He wanted it to be crucified so he could be raised up to walk in newness of life. If you haven't done that, 
you have an opportunity. You can confess Jesus as Lord. We've got water ready. Isn't that amazing? We don't have to go to Naugatuck River. We, we can do it right here. And we even have garments that you can change into that are modest. And we, can, we even have towels and a dryer back there if you want to blow your hair. It's not a problem for me. But some of you might want to do that. We have a dryer back there to dry your hair. If you haven't accepted Jesus Christ, if you haven't obeyed the good news, you have an opportunity as we stand and sing. But most of you have already done that. Is there a lesson for you? Yes. That we need to preach this gospel to other people. We need to share it with somebody. We shouldn't be like people on a sinking ship that are just trying to save ourselves. We need to realize this whole place is going down. We want to save as many as possible.